everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's me, Jackie, almost close to the end of 2021. <laughs> that was why I paused. I had I to know. make sure when this episode was airing. Is, this re- is it recording 2021? or It's, it's recording 2021 no, and airing It's releasing 2021. 2022. Oh, okay. So it's, yes. it's just, okay. It's just, just coming out. Okay. So then I get to be... No, no, no. This episode's coming out in 2021, right? It's, okay, it's a 2021 yeah. episode. You know, mm-hmm. I wish I could remember these things. It's, it's like, hard. it's like my memory. I don't know if it's my mind file, if it's just, I didn't, I didn't put it in the right it's drawer your, it's of remembering. Is it my <laughs> homunculus? Your homunculus hasn't found the proper manila folder I need a better looking. I needed to give it a better mind filing so maybe I need a bigger mind file like one of those like huge ones like a space issue is what it is yeah you yeah. have to go to yeah. the container store that's what I need I need some sort of a fancy system like a California mind closet is probably <laughs> what I need absolutely <laughs> but you know what I don't know something tells me that our special guest and and I think us as well would not really think of memory quite like that and who better to discuss the behavior analytic interpretation of memory than the man who wrote the book chapter on <laughs> on memory, Dr. David Palmer. Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight to talk about memory with us. It's my pleasure. Actually, speaking of memory, Dave, I don't think I told everyone out there what they're listening to, which is a podcast about behavior analysis. <laughs> now, me- you know, memory, here we go. We're talking about it and I'm forgetting everything about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research. And yes, As we already said, and as he already said hello, we're talking about memory with Dr. Dave Palmer. So now that I've remembered everything I need to remember to start the show, why don't we get into the actual good stuff, which is hearing from you, Dave, talking about memory and, you know, the the interpretation of, of memory in behavior analytic terminology. Okay. But before we do that, in case there are listeners out there who do not know who you are, it's it's a, it, it's going to be a, a minority of listeners. But for those few, would, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Not at all. I was not a psychologist in college. I was a geology major and, and an English major and eventually just graduated in time to dodge the draft. And in those days, this was when the Vietnam War was raging. I, I picked up a copy of Walden II off a friend's bookshelf and I l- read it and it just, I found it electrifying. So I spent the next 10 years or so trying to start a Walden II community. So I was living hand to mouth and trying to squeeze a living out of various practical jobs that might be helpful to a community. And all, all the while I was reading Skinner books. And so I was a self-taught Skinnerian and I was more and more astounded by the power of Skinner's analysis. You know, I started off with Walden II, which was idealistic. Uh, uh, by the way, Walden II, for those who don't know, is a fictional utopia organized around behavioral principles written by Skinner. Then I read the rest of the Skinner canon on my own and was just overwhelmed by how parsimonious and, and powerful his, his account was. It was when I read the papers on phylogeny and ontogeny of behavior, when, I, when he talks about the analogy between shaping by reinforcement and evolution by natural selection. And the the parallel between the two processes was really hit me like a hammer because it it suggested that the reinforcement principle is extraordinarily parsimonious and powerful, just like natural selection. And just as natural selection can, in principle at least, explain the evolution of any any old beast that you can think of, Reinforcement has the power in principle to explain any permutation of behavioral mutations and so on. So it just seemed to me to be so parsimony, so elegant, that it just couldn't possibly be wrong. Anyway, I I wormed my way into graduate school through the back door, kind of by parking myself on people's doorsteps and saying, (laughs) I'm not going to leave until you accept me. And I ended up in grad school at UMass in, in 1980, and I was working with John Donahoe. And together, we were quite compatible because we were both interested in those phenomena, those behavioral phenomena that kind of lie on the periphery of of the field, the things that are most difficult to explain. We both felt sort of intuitively that there must be a behavior analytic interpretation of 
the full range of of behavioral phenomena and and so we were attracted to those those puzzles that that kind of lie at the fringe and that and when I got my degree, I got a job teaching statistics at Smith College, which was convenient because by that time I was already settled in this area, and I didn't want to move to you know Kalamazoo or <laughs> Gainesville or someplace so i so I was happy to take that job teaching statistics and I stayed at Smith for thirty years. I had the one behavior analysis class, but there that was only taught maybe half the time. So it was mainly my job was teaching statistics. But I'm still a hard-boiled Skinnerian, and I, I don't retract anything that I dreamed about when I was <laughs> 21 years old. Did you ever read Not the... Not everyone can say that. Yeah. Did, <laughs> yeah. did you ever read the Enjoy Old Age by Skinner? Oh, yes. Uh, several it's, times. It's one of my favorite. Yeah. When it first came out, when it didn't really apply to me, and then I reread it at least twice more, and and now I, it's particularly salient to me now because <laughs> there's so many applications of it. Wow! So, Dave, your your story of getting into behavior analysis is way better than mine. Of I needed a job right after college, <laughs> and there was a school for autism down the street from where I was living at the time. So, uh-huh. uh, <laughs> well, much however, you, however you get there, that's the important thing. That's true. I think yours yours is the much more I think romanticized version of what everyone wishes their you know their journey <laughs> was the. It's always fall in Western Mass. Yeah, I know. Always. Yeah, and it's perfect Throughout setting. I know. Yeah, ah. the leaves. So tonight we will be talking about your ninety one chapter, a behavioral interpretation of memory from uh, Hayes and Chase's dialogues on verbal behavior. Mm-hmm. And kind of funny thing, Jackie, right before we started recording, Jackie was mentioning that kind of the genesis of in- inviting you on because, you know, we we had a chance to run one of our Babbitt specials and certainly we've, you know, either seen you talk or seen you uh, around all these times. But, you know, we, we're, we're, we're still we're still after a number of years doing the show. We're very nervous of actually <laughs> reaching out to people still oh. like it must be on a podcast. Like, come on. <laughs> That's so true. But uh, a listener emailed and I want to read it. It's like. I really would love to hear and love Dave Palmer, especially the conceptual papers on memory and dreams, but anything he wants to talk about, I'll listen to. (laughs) And then I was like, okay, yeah, that's like a really great idea. I'll reach out. And then she's like, fingers crossed. And then I wrote back and said, yes, he's interested. And she wrote, I am freaking out. Dot, 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 dot. Seriously? Exclamation points, exclamation. Oh, thank you. Long lines. But you you left out the like emoji that, that says, says love, love it. it on the top. <laughs> <laughs> so, listener Roseanne, this is for you. Okay. All right. Well, well. Hope, hope we don't disappoint her. Right. <laughs> we have an <laughs> audience of at least one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I guess the place we should probably start with with memory, Dave, is you know Rob will now sing the song "Memory" from. <laughs> oh, jeez, yeah. <laughs> uh, is what what is sort of the classic non behavioral viewpoint of of memory? What 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 memory is? So maybe the way you would have thought of memory before you wrote this, before you wrote this chapter, or the way the average person sort of probably thinks of you know memory when just asked in the street, "Hey, what's memory?" The way the average person thinks of memory, and the way the average psychologist thinks of memory is as a storage bin for experience and that we, whatever we do gets filed away in this immense library somewhere in the head. And when we have occasion to recall something, we, we have to go into the library and fumble around through the books until we come to the volume that has the memory in it. And then we pull, pull the memory out and our behavior at that point is governed by what's on the page of that book in that in that library so it's a it's a storage metaphor that memories are packed away in the head in some kind of format that they can be searched for found and retrieved and control our behavior i think you you describe it very nicely in the in the chapter that the challenge with that well well i mean you know i I think you even agree it's kind of an elegant metaphor but it doesn't really give us as individuals much to work with you know what are we talking about like oh my neur my neurons have a a filing system or oh as i add more neurons or you know uh, pare down neurons that somehow makes a memory like it it just becomes a circular 
know, discussion. Yes, it, it doesn't really explain anything. It's, it's, a, it's a metaphor. You know, it's kind of a plausible mem- metaphor because we are changed by our experiences and, and those changes reveal themselves day to day and month to month and so on and, and, and decade to decade. So there's a, there's a plausibility to it. And the problem is just a metaphor and, and there's no, no way to put any meat on the bones of that kind of theory. An argument I like to, to make to people is, let's say, well, I went to the dentist yesterday. So if you ask me today, what did I do yesterday? I said, well, I went to the dentist. If we were to take a break and come back tomorrow, and you said to me, what did you do? And you wanted me to tr- retrieve the, the, the dentist memory. What would you say? Would you say, what did you do yesterday? Well, Today, the word yesterday evokes this discussion of the, of, the, of the dentist, but tomorrow you're going to have to use a different index. You're going to have to say the day before yesterday. Well, what how did you does do the, the day before the day before the day before the <laughs> yeah. day before the day before yesterday? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, it implies that every, every day at midnight, some little army of homunculi run around the brain and <laughs> change the labels on the books because of the yesterday book. <laughs> is no longer going to have yesterday's memories in it as soon as the as midnight happens. So, so everything's got to be, card catalog has to be updated every, every 24 hours. And of course, that's just one example of, of an unlimited number of examples of the, the great difficulty in putting some kind of content into the storage metaphor. Now, it's true that the nervous system changes as with experience. But where in the nervous system is the memory? And, and this is something Rob was alluding to. It's a little bit like a light bulb. You, you might think, well, the light is stored in the bulb because when the, <laughs> when the lamp doesn't have a bulb in it, there's no light, but you screw the bulb in and it lights up. So the, the, the light must be inside the bulb. But of course, that's not true. The, the light emits, the, the bulb emits light when electricity courses through it. And and the nervous system emits behavior when stimuli bombard us. So we're more of a conduit than a, than a, than a repository of memories. That is, the memory is evoked, or, or the, the behavior we call memory is evoked by the context and the stimuli. Let me rephrase that. It's the, we're responding to current stimuli at every moment. We're not responding to the past. Everything we do is in response to the present. And if we behave with respect to the, or if we seem to behave with respect to the past, what we're doing is behaving with respect to stimuli that are evoking behavior that was perhaps conditioned in the past, but it's the present stimuli that are evoking those behavior, that, that, that behavior. So anyway, that, that, that's the standard storage metaphor of, of memory. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's appealing but it doesn't take us very far. Mm-hmm. In, in fact, it takes us down a blind alley because mm-hmm. you end up looking for things that aren't there. Mm-hmm. We're just the myelin sheath. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the oh, axe. Shoot. The axe on. Right? I'm I trying know. to remember what are all my all my neuro one hundred and one terms. <laughs> Synaptic cleft. That's <laughs> yeah. So, Dave, when it came time to write about this, the, the behavioral interpretation of memory was that something that you know, you decided to write as part of a, a bet with a psychologist colleague. You just were like, I'm tired. Like someone just, someone said the word neuron one too many times. And you just said, that's enough of this. I'm writing this down. It's a longer story than that. I, I had been gnawing away at the problem of memory for years. As I had become persuaded of the, by the power of the behavioral approach, I saw more and more and more applications of the principles and and how it could explain more and more and more behavior but i got stumped when it came to memory because i couldn't see how it worked and i couldn't see how it was consistent with with a behavior analytic interpretation uh, with with behavior analysis principles so let me just give you an example suppose jackie and i go out to a diner for breakfast on monday Yum. And Jackie orders blueberry pancakes. I would do that too. You know me and so on well. Tuesday, 
Jackie and I go out to the same diner, and this time she orders a cheese omelet. And on Tuesday afternoon, so okay, on Monday she gets blueberry pancakes, on Tuesday she gets a cheese omelet. On Tuesday afternoon, she comes to my office at Smith College, and it's a it's beige paint. There's a copy of Verbal Behavior on the shelf. There's a computer console. Uh, I can label all the various stimuli. And I say to Jackie, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? And she says, blueberry pancakes. Now, I had been taking notes yesterday I'd, on, on Monday, so I knew that that was the correct answer. And so I leap out of my chair and I say, yes, that's right. And I pull out my wallet. And I start showering her with dollar bills. And I mean, she's really tickled to death. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I'm so impressed that she remembered that she had blueberry pancakes. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to pay good money for it to, to hear about it. So Tuesday comes and goes. Wednesday, we don't have breakfast. But she came to my office at 2 p.m. on Tuesday. At 2 p.m. on Wednesday, she comes to my office. The copy of Verbal Behaviors on the shelf, the computer console is there, the walls are still beige, I'm sitting in the same spot. The, I've recreated the situation perfectly. It's exactly, precisely the same context. And I say to her, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? Now, of course, she's going to say blueberry pancakes, because in this context, saying blueberry pancakes has been lavishly reinforced. <laughs> And our principals say, well, of course, she's going to say blueberry pancakes. That's what the principle of reinforcement tells us. But she doesn't. She says, cheese omelet. And where's my money? <laughs> 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 and so the question is, where did cheese omelet come from? And why doesn't she say blueberry pancakes? Because the context is precisely the same. Now, everyone says, well, of course she said cheese omelet, because that's the right answer. <laughs> that's not good enough. The question is, why, <laughs> how, how does she know that that's the right answer? How, what, what's controlling her behavior at this moment, at this time? So, so that was the, the conundrum that I was wrestling with. And that was even before I started graduate school. I, I started graduate school, in, but, but r roughly, let's say roughly 1979. In 1980, I started grad, grad school, and I started, now I was among the bigwigs, so I started mm -hmm. asking professors and fellow graduate students, and I was flabbergasted to discover that they had the lamest ideas about how memory worked. They said, well, it's just the endurance of stimulus control, or one person said, one elite person in our field said, it's temporal, it's controlled by temporarily remote stimuli. Yesterday's breakfast reaches forward in time to control <laughs> behavior, Jackie's behavior, 24 hours or 30, 30 hours later. So I, I found those explanations preposterous or, or, or just inadequate. They weren't, they weren't ridiculous. They were just inadequate <laughs> because they didn't really grapple with the problem. And I was surprised that they didn't see it as a problem. And that makes me think that your listeners are not going to see it as a problem. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to persuade people who don't sort of get it off, right off the bat that it is a problem. You have to, we have to be able to point to the controlling variables of your behavior at every moment in time. And when Jackie says cheese omelet, we have to know what it is that's controlling that behavior. And, and you know, we can, we can resort to the little box in the brain. We can say, ah, it's the, the book. The book says cheese omelet, and the mm. homunculus changed the, <laughs> the headings to yesterday and so on, so uh, is is not satisfactory. So anyway, the, that, that's sort of the backstory. And I had, by 1983, I had finished my master's thesis. And at UMass, to proceed to the PhD, you have to write something called a comprehensive paper, which is analogous to, to a review paper today, a comprehensive paper that integrated a number of different domains of psychology. So I, I chose memory because it could be looked at from a cognitive, developmental, behavioral, or clinical point of view. So there were at least four different perspectives that one might take on memory. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I basically didn't say anything at all about the other three 
oh. points of view. <laughs> uh, I I just uh, devoted my constant my time to this this one topic, and I struggled and struggled and struggled with that concept with the, with the, with the with the with the topic because it just wasn't working to my satisfaction but the more i chewed on it i remember the the time i was i, I was working late at night in the psychology building and i and it was the psych building was connected to the english department and i was walking through these deserted corridors at night pounding my head and i lay down on a on a heat register in the english department dark and it was then that i realized or somehow it had occurred to me that memory is not a homogeneous phenomenon that it's a heterogeneous phenomenon that the that the kinds of things that don't fit in a stimulus control context, are not really memory at all. They're, they're problem solving. Mm -hmm. And when when I realized that, everything just started falling in place. That is, mm -hmm. we really have two phenomena. We have memory as what I call a stimulus control phenomenon, and memory as a problem solving phenomenon. And they are they are quite different explanations for phenomena. And that was where the paper came from. I, I wrote I wrote it up and and. In 1984, actually, and I presented it at a conference in 1986, and there were a bunch of bigwigs at that conference, and and they were, you know, and I was just this little nerdy graduate student, so <laughs> it was gratifying that they that they appreciated it and encouraged. I'm glad me. they were nice to you. Yes, they were. They were very nice. <laughs> it, was, it was it was quite flattering that they were mm -hmm. so excited by the idea. I find it hard to believe that they'd be like, no, I'm pretty sure that this long, <laughs> well-described uh, phenomenon you're talking about, no, no, I think the one about the temporarily reaching forward, I think that's the one we're going to go with. You know? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't published till 1991 because of some glitches. It, everyone at the conference agreed to submit their papers to a common book, and the publisher backed out. And so uh, mm. Steve Hayes eventually came forward and, and arranged to yeah. start the publishing company, Context Press. And that was, I think, the first book in that series. Wow. Oh. That's great. That's big, big Good in a lot of ways. That's really yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was Reviewer 2. <laughs> reviewer 2? You know, the Reviewer 2 is the horrible reviewer, right? Oh, Your oh, tough yeah. reviewer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. So, Dave, you kind of mentioned it in, in the background, but certainly when you read the chapter or, or the paper, you know, it, it, it does have this kind of flow between talking about, you know, memory as, as stimulus control or then discussing, okay, well, wait, you know, what, what part could, you know, that the you know, problem solving play into memory or, you know, mm -hmm. how, how, how do conditioned perceptual behaviors play into it? When you were sort of developing the interpretation overall, was this sort of just the path that your kind of research and your overall thought process was taking? Or was this something that you had all these ideas simultaneously and you just sort of had to put them in an order when it came to, to writing it all down. It was more the latter. I didn't, I didn't have any kind of coherent idea of, of where this, how this was going to work mm -hmm. when I started. I, I thought it was going to be a matter of going to the literature and, and pulling out re references and, and summarizing what had been done and leaving with a bunch of questions. So, the, you know, the things that I'd been unable to answer, I thought I would be able to offer those in a conclusion as as directions for the field to things for the field to to just to work on this whole sort of scheme of the paper came together kind of at the at the last minute it was mm. it was not planned that way <laughs> it, it definitely read to me at least you know when i read it through the first time as if i were sort of following the thought process throughout and then you know certainly i think the, the problem you know problem solving as memory and sort of the description of memory not being a developmental process so much as learned behavior like i felt like that just that concluded the whole thing and that's the piece i kind of mm -hmm. I, I took i took the most from it probably because again it was the last thing i read in the, pa in the paper right. but i put like smiley faces all over that section i did <laughs> <laughs> but i think that's a sign of a well-written paper not yes. just of you david there's a story when you're able to take your reader from a concept they don't maybe know that much or thought that much about all the way to the end and they also feel like they've discovered it with the writer along the way <laughs> Even though the writer really knew all along what they yeah. were doing. Well, the, the, the paper itself 
was written after the, I, I wrote the paper for my committee in 1984 or 85, 84, I think it was. And I wrote the paper that you're reading in 1986 when I was presenting at this conference. I, I sort of went back and distilled it all down into a, a coherent story, whereas the, the paper that I wrote for my committee was, was less clear. That's how writing goes. That's how yeah, I mean, that's, that's why we iterated our writing. I suppose <laughs> it's good when you get in that final in that final that final component. So, Dave, why don't we take a little break and then we'll come back and we'll get a little bit into the into the meat of the paper itself, and you can describe every different section because there are a lot of them. not every single, but you know we'll, we'll get the, the gist of it for the for the listeners. It might be hard to describe the whole thing uh, while they're you know folding laundry or driving in a car. <laughs> okay, great. I will be right back. Hey, everyone. Before we get back to our conversation with Dr. Palmer, I want to remind you all that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. And by listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is finish listening to the show, then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs. That's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S and enter in two secret code words. And since we have a special guest, we have special guest secret code words. The first one is BARD. B-A-R-R-E-D. Although uh, Dr. Palmer said if anyone accidentally says B-A-R-D like a bard, like, you know, the guy who sings songs or Shakespeare, then that would that, that should count too. So we say that's fine. But the reference is actually to a type of chicken. B-A-R-R-E-D, a bard chicken. That is something I did not know. You learn something new every podcast, right? All right, bard. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your Postmaster Certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking with Dr. David Palmer about memory and exactly what the behavioral interpretation of memory is. So, Dave, before we get into, I know I promised all the listeners we get right into the paper, but before we do, could you sort of describe why it's a behavioral interpretation of memory? I mean, you you spend a section at the beginning of the chapter talking about the idea of, you know, an interpretation. And for some folks, that might be kind of a a term that isn't familiar or makes it sound like you mean it to be like, it's it's a wild guess rather than, you know, a thought out process. So what exactly is a behavioral interpretation? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I got this from Skinner. And by the way, I, I want, want to preface everything I say by saying that naturally, when I was working on this paper, the first thing I did was to go to Skinner. But if you look through the indexes of Skinner's books, there's no mention of memory or the, the, or what there is, is just this, a piddling little reference here and there. Mm-hmm. And although I had read, I had read verbal behavior and science and human behavior, I didn't remember. I didn't realize how much Skinner does talk about memory in those in those books and in fact the stuff that i the conclusion i came to is completely compatible with everything skinner did say well i guess i'm i'm patting myself on the back for <laughs> discovering independently i i didn't actually get it from skinner but he of course had thought about all this stuff he never bothered <laughs> to write it down in a coherent package about memory so i i didn't didn't know how much he had said scattered throughout all, all of his, all those books, uh, you know, a few pages in science, he, human behavior, mm-hmm. a couple of pages in verbal behavior. But in any case, the idea of an interpretation that I got squarely from Skinner, this also was a powerful idea. Skinner's verbal behavior 
Well, when he set out writing verbal behavior, he, he had planned sort of as I did with memory to talk about a lot of empirical stuff. But he realized that there really wasn't much empirical work for the bulk of what he had to say. And what an interpretation is, is an explanation of some real world phenomenon expressed exclusively in terms of principles that have been derived from a laboratory analysis. A, a good analogy is with physics. Much of the physics I learned when I was in college came directly from Isaac Newton. And Newton formulated the three laws of motion, you know, uh, inertia and action and reaction and so on, a body at rest, tends to stay at rest and whatnot, way back in the late 1600s. Those principles he derived from experimental analyses that he conducted with, with pendulums and inclined planes and, and colliding billiard balls and so on. And it's rather astonishing that he was able to extract these principles from his experimental analyses, but he did. He was able to, to do so, along with some powerful mathematics that he also invented. But then he took those principles and he extended them to things where he had no experimental control whatsoever, like the moon. So he calculated the orbits of the planets and the, and the, and the moon and so on, and, and found that the law of gravitation that he had formulated for pendulums and other things applied to the heavenly bodies insofar as he could tell from the obs observations that were known at the time. And he applied them to all kinds, um, every moving body, basically, every, every non-living moving body, he, he, he was able to describe the motion of. And so the tides, he had a, a, a Newton explained the tides in, in terms of the gravitational attraction of the moon. And we all accept that is scientific. That is, that we, we think the universe is the way it is because it's been proven scientifically. Well, it hasn't been proven experimentally. It's, it's simply an interpretation. We take the principles which have been basically proven experimentally, we take those principles and apply them to places where we don't have experimental control. And it makes sense out of that phenomenon. So the tides now make sense because we know that the Earth is exerting this, the Moon is exerting this gravitational attraction, and so it stretches out the water on the Earth, and we get these two tides a day. Another example would be Darwin's theory of, of evolution. It's, it's based on painstaking field data, and as well as now genetic theories and so on. And it ex and we ex we take the principle of natural selection and we extend it to this enormous range of phenomena where we have no experimental control. So if someone wants to know why the whale has little tiny leg bones, you say, well, it's because it descended from a land animal like a hippopotamus. Well, that's an interpretation. We don't have the lineage of organisms from hippo to whale or some kind of precursor to both. But it ties together the available data in a perfectly plausible way. Geology is the same way. We, we interpret the, and this is one of Skinner's points, we interpret the mountain building, the t movement of tectonic plates, in terms of the way molten material behaves in the laboratory. If the core of the Earth is molten, then, then we would get these various phenomena. One last example is astronomy. We believe that the universe is expanding because the light that's coming from the stars looks just like the light we have down here on Earth, except all the wavelengths are shifted very slightly. So the light that's emitted by incandescent lithium, for example, is very slightly shifted to the red end of the spectrum from the light that comes from lithium that's incandescent on Earth. And that's consistent with the notion that the stars are receding from us. And if the star is approaching us, it would be shifted to the blue end of the spectrum. So, so again, the whole, our whole understanding of cosmology is an interpretation. It's not an experimental analysis. We experimentally analyze things down here on Earth in laboratories. We hammer out the fine details down to the tiniest little detail if possible. And we extrapolate 
to all the uncontrolled phenomena there are. So, so a behavioral interpretation takes the principles of behavior, classical and operant conditioning and stimulus control and extinction and punishment and so on, takes the various principles of behavior and applies them to phenomena where we don't have tight experimental control, which is the whole domain of human behavior. People are very reluctant to turn their, their infants over to mad psychologists to, you know, to raise in Skinner boxes and at 80% of their free feeding weight and so on. So we, we, we can't do that kind of research on humans. So we have to make do with applying behavioral principles to the available data we have. And, and we have plenty of data. It's just not tightly controlled. So Skinner applied the principles of behavior to verbal behavior, and hence his, his, his book, which is, as far as I'm concerned, a magnificent success. And it's just what I did with the interpretation of, of memory. I'm, I'm, a, I'm restricting my tools to those tools that have emerged from the behavioral laboratory, reinforcement and stimulus control and extinction and blocking and so on. And I mean, that's what we do with all private events, right? Because we can't necessarily observe them. That's right. And so we would extrapolate what we believe. We, you know, we're making that assumption that in the events that happen within the skin and the events that happen outside of the skin are acting under the same laws of nature. Yeah. That's the fun, that's like the fun the, part. The Doobie 2003 behavioral interpretation of joint attention mm -hmm. is a nice other example of this process. Mm -hmm. So Dave, when we go back to memory, you know, in the paper, you know, you sort of talk about some kind of different examples. You talk about, you know, kind of the, the stimulus control idea of memories, memories problem solving. And then you kind of have the example of like, you know, Jackie and breakfast. That would be an example of, of well, memory. <laughs> However, it's very specifically kind of, you know, you, you, one, could, one could say like, oh, that's just, just a basic, you know, representation of reinforcement versus say, you know, when we think of that more complex task of now I'm naming something that I can't, you know, there's no way that Jackie's response is controlled by anything in the environment, by history of reinforcement, as we usually think of history of reinforcement. Now, are both of those considered memory? You know, when someone says five times five, which I, I just, you know, pulled, pulled from the paper, they say five times five, and I say 25. Would that be considered memory? The same way that, you know, hey, do you remember the name of your teacher from, you know, 20 years ago, and I'm able to come up with a name would be considered memory? Yes, well, and yes. I know both. <laughs> Y yes and yes, Jackie's right. That that is traditionally all that's under the rubric of memory, and and that was what I was assuming when I started this uh, odyssey. And I and I still I'm happy to call them both memory, but they're very different kinds of phenomena. They require different explanations. So they're 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 different phenomena, but we can call them both memory. I guess cats and dogs are both pets. So. Mm -hmm. So we call them pets, but they're very different organisms. I like that. That's really, that's a, that, that, that really actually simplifies very nicely. So what, what are the sort of the, the mechanisms in the interpretation behind both of these being memories, but not developing in, in quite the same way? The distinction between the two is, is this. When we talk about the endurance of stimulus control, we're talking about, let's, let's just take an, ex, uh, an experiment from the, from the, from the laboratory. You teach a pigeon a discrimination between a red and a green light. So in the presence of the red light, the pigeon is reinforced on some schedule of reinforcement. In the presence of the green light, it's on extinction. You can turn the pigeon's behavior on and off by changing the color of the light. And we take the pigeon out of the chamber and put it back in its home cage. Then we go on vacation and we come back and two weeks later, someone's been feeding our pigeon. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we like, come back in two I'm weeks. I'm so hungry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And we say, okay, Pidge, it's time to get back to work. We put the pigeon in the chamber, turn on the red light, and it starts pecking like crazy. Turn on the green light, it stops. And this is a case of memory in the sense that the pigeon has remembered, if you will, the training from two weeks ago. What's endured is stimulus control. That is, the, the, what, it, what it learned two weeks ago was to peck in the presence of red, to do something else in the presence of green. And when the red and green lights are presented at a later time, the behavior is under the control of those lights because of the history of reinforcement. 
there's nothing mysterious about it. It's simply a straightforward, it, it follows in a straightforward way from the principle of reinforcement. Re- reinforcement, you know, increasing the probability of behavior in the context in which it, reinforcement occurs and so on. So we can think of that as the endurance of stimulus control. And as an aside, pigeons can remember, pigeon, stimulus control can endure for a very long time in pigeons. Mm-hmm. My advisor, John Donahoe, had done an experiment, a discrimination experiment with a, pigeons, a pigeon named Henry in his learning class around 1970. And pigeons live a long time. And so he, when Henry was done with his semester, he put him up in the breeding colony up on the roof of the building, which was a big <laughs> concrete building, gray concrete, concrete with chicken wire surrounding it. You can't do that uh, now, I don't think. <laughs> no, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Henry was up there for 12 years wow. before oh. Donahoe said, I wonder if Henry remembers his tricks. So he brought him back down. <laughs> And turned on the lights, and Henry responded appropriately with respect to the. Th- it was a three-color discrimination. Now, oh, the important Henry. thing about this, it just shows that stimulus control can endure. Uh, th- this was remarkable, and it surely would not have happened except for one feature of Henry's experience. Henry had never seen red, green, or yellow lights in the interim, or oh. red, green, and blue mm-hmm. lights. I can't remember what it was. In, in the 12 years, Henry was up in a concrete bunker, living it up with the female pigeons and <laughs> yeah, eating and drinking and, and having it's a high old time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was real Walden too for pigeons. <laughs> so there was no interfering behavior. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. It's kind of illustrative that, that he was able to do this, but almost certainly because of the failure to have competing things conditioned to those stimuli. Right. And, and one thing that I'm thinking of is when we read this paper in my, my class in radical behaviorism, students get sometimes confused around memory as the behavior, right? And memory is not the behavior, remembering right. is the behavior. Mm-hmm. So you bring that up in, in, the, in the article. It's good to remember. <laughs> like, right, the memory is, is the interpretation and the remembering is the behavior that we're looking at that may, you know, be sustained or not. Yeah. And it always seems so simple when you read this paper. Oh, like, oh yeah, of course, you know, or, or Bill Ahern is our advisor and he would explain it the same way. He's like, it's, it's not hard, guys. It's just, it's the behavior of remembering. That's all it is. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. But the, the issue is that we are inundated with the storage metaphor mm-hmm. of memory and our language is constructed to talk about it through that metaphor. So it's just... It's really hard, I think, to escape from it and try to think about it from this behavior analytic perspective. Mm-hmm. Yes, that, that's right. It is it is so ingrained. We tend to think of memory as the as the behavior, but 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 you're right. the The memory is the is, is the pecking of the key, right? Or saying blueberry pancakes. It's the behavior that has to be explained, not memory. And w- once we've explained the behavior. We've explained Remember, all there is to right. explain. <laughs> so funny, when I first started dating my husband, this is like way back in the way back time machine, we got into a fight about memory and you storage files. And I still remember it, but we didn't talk for two days. Oh, dear. Because, because he told me, and I was like, this is going to be the end of it. This is the really? end of our relationship before it's even begun. Because like, he's like, of course I have like a storage file. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is the, what is going to break our relationship up. And we didn't talk for two days and we had to like sit down. Wow. I actually had him read your paper. I'm sure he really. <laughs> he's not a behavior analyst. He's not. Love, people, love right, that. He haven't ever thought about this. And even a lot of BCBAs may never have thought right. about this. But he did way. read it and he did appreciate it. He and reads a lot. In your husband's defense, he reads a lot about science. So he it's, does. It's, it's not like it, you know, he's. <laughs> but he isn't a behavior analyst. At that point, he was a poet and he did appreciate your writing. Mm-hmm. too so that was funny i remember i am remembering that now that that was like our big our first big fight Yikes. surrounding memory <laughs> well i'm sorry to have been the cause of, of <laughs> it's like i just learned this <laughs> so dave when we talk about memory is sort of that long-term stimulus control but then you also in the paper talk about memory as sort of that problem-solving technique and this was my favorite 
section of, of the article I, in terms of remembering. I remember where I was, you know, we'll talk maybe a little later about the, you know, conditioned perceptual behavior. I remember where I was and I was, my son was swimming and it had like a swim lesson and I'm sitting and reading and I'm, this all makes sense. You know, the examples you present. And then I believe I actually tried to model good remembering on the car ride home. Oh. <laughs> you know, I know it wasn't an advice, it's not an advice paper, but I still was like, I, I'm going to try it out and see if, if this is, you know, how his, how his memory or his remembering skills develop. Mm-hmm. But could you talk about that process as well? Because I, 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 I thought that was the most, so exciting. Right, right. I, I, th- I think that's the, it, to the extent that there's an original bit, that's the original part. The, the memory is a stimulus control phenomenon is a straightforward extrapolation of, of behavioral principles. So we expect the pigeon to peck the the green key and so on. When we when the stimulus is, is presented a second time or at a later time, we so to speak expect the organism to behave according to its reinforcement history. And before we move to this other thing, I will say that regarding how long it will endure, for in Henry's case, it endured for you know most of his life. Where does forgetting come in? We don't so to speak remember every stimulus that's been correlated with reinforcement in our history, where does the failure to remember come from? And, and there are a number of possibilities. I, I talk about you know, competing behavior in the presence of the same stimulus or competing stimuli. I talk about the possibility of neurological degradation that comes simply from, from living, that there's, you know, our nervous systems are not static, so there can be some kind of decay, but, but, but not a systematic but that's not a systematic process. It, there are things that we remember from our childhood with clarity. There are other things that we that have been lost. So it's not as if you forget, you know, you can remember something for six years and then it all goes away. But there are a number of reasons why stimulus control might not be might not endure indefinitely. It's funny when those things that do, though, right? Like when you remember the lines from your like third grade play mm-hmm. about popcorn. Like, why is that there? <laughs> well, and I think that gets into right. some of all these other kind yeah. of you know, mediating factors. I, I, but anyway, sorry that one. When I read that, I was like, yeah. Since I can repeat that, like peanuts, popcorn, buy some today. We have it all for you in this little tray from my third grade play. <laughs> <laughs> can sing the whole song. Yes, I bet you can. <laughs> well, no, that's that's that shows the endurance of stimulus control. But there are probably things that you can't remember from third grade, like everything else. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So turning to the memory as a problem-solving phenomenon, this is a case where behavior is brought under control of a stimulus through reinforcement at one time, and then that same behavior is called for at a later time, but the stimulus is not present. So it's as if we said to Henry the pigeon, okay, Henry, we're not going to turn on the lights. You just got to go through your routine. Now, that goes beyond the behavioral principles. That is, there's no principle of behavior that suggests that the behavior should just happen in the absence of the controlling variables. So when I say to Jackie, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? If the only time she's ever heard that question was the day before, and so on, and, and Wednesday I asked her, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? If nobody ever asked her about yesterday's breakfast in her entire life, her whole experience would be confined to what happened on Tuesday. And we would surely expect her to say blueberry pancakes, that is, uh, what, what happened on Monday. But in fact, she doesn't. She, she talks about what happened on Tuesday. Because now it's Wednesday. Yesterday was Tuesday. So anyway, the point is, the stimulus conditions seem to evoke one thing, but we get something else. We get something which is actually scheduled for reinforcement. That is, I'm going to reinforce her saying cheese omelet, not blueberry pancakes. I want her to answer the question correctly, not robotically. So I don't want her to just parrot out the answer for Monday. I want her to, to thoughtfully figure out what she did on Tuesday. But there's nothing in the environment that evokes saying Tuesday's breakfast. There's nothing that evokes cheese omelet in the context of Wednesday's discussion. The, the, the room at Smith College 
has nothing to remind her of, of, of Chi's omelet. So it's a problem. What, what makes it a problem is that I'm, you know, implicitly going to shower her with gold if she answers correctly. <laughs> In other words, I'm offering reinforcement. Usually when we ask a question, no gold is involved, but, but, <laughs> but there's, there's still a contingency there. The, there's a slight social pressure to answer a question honestly and so on. So there's, there are contingencies. To say that the response is scheduled for reinforcement is, is correct. I'm just making it a very explicit, mm -hmm. lavish reinforcement to, to illustrate the point. So it's scheduled for reinforcement, but the, the rooms, the Smith College office does not evoke saying yesterday's, uh, whatever it was, uh, cheese omelet. Yet that's the right answer. So she has to go about supplying herself with mnemonic cues that will evoke cheese omelet. That is, it's not, it's not the Smith College room that's evoking cheese omelet. It's what Jackie says to herself. And if Jackie is noncompliant and, and refuses to behave, she says, I ain't doing nothing until I get my gold. Nothing can make her say cheese omelet except her own behavior with respect to her own repertoire. So she will start to prompt herself with mnemonic cues. She'll say, well, let's see, what, what's today? Today's Wednesday. Okay, yesterday was Tuesday. Well, Tuesday is the day that my husband writes poems, and uh, they drive me nuts. So I really have to bulk up on my proteins on Tuesdays. <laughs> She starts probing her repertoire with behavior that is its strength. We can talk about where these behaviors come from. They're, they're, they're acquired strategies. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's strategic remembering. Jackie has learned how to, to probe her repertoire to, e to evoke verbal behavior with respect to the past. But the point is that it's, it's formally, formally perfectly analogous with problem solving of mm -hmm. a generic sort. That is, a problem, we have a problem when there's some behavior scheduled for reinforcement that is not currently strong. So we have to go about bringing that behavior to strength, the, the, the behavior that solves the problem. So if I say to you, what's 2.5% of 124, and you don't have a calculator and don't have access to the internet or something, it's a problem because I am implicitly promising you at least approval or, or praise or, or something, there's some social pressure to, to, to show that you can do it. And so you get out your pencil and paper and you start twiddling around with numbers and, and you come up with the answer 3.1. And I say, yes, that's right. Well, where did 3.1 come from? Well, it came from the mediating behavior of writing down the number 124 and multiplying by 2.5% and, and there's some shortcuts that you could use. You know, 10% is 12 .4 and two and a half percent is a quarter of that. So there, there are various mediating behaviors that you could engage in to come up with a number 3.1. It doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from the products of your mediating behavior. In the case of a calculation like that, we all do it more or less the same way. Well, there, there, are, only, there are a few ways to do it, but, but we all acquire those strategies through our experience in school and in life as well, if we happen to do a lot of mathy things. So explaining how we solve a math problem is easy because most people do it the same way. And so it has a lot of plausibility. So, I, so even if I don't see you writing the, on, the, on the paper, I can infer that you've done so. And, and of course, you can do it in your head. You can do it in your head, as I said, by saying, well, it's, it's a quarter of a tenth. So 124 divided by 10 is 12.4. Divide that by 4, you get 4 to 12 is 3. 4 into 4 is 1, 3.1. So when Jackie or, or, or and anyone comes up with the answer 3.1, we don't say, oh, my God, this is this is supernatural which is <laughs> reinforced for saying that how could she do it they well, might ask me if i did a math problem <laughs> how did she do that 
<laughs> it could in fact be supernatural. <laughs> right, it might be yeah. supernatural. <laughs> well, but it could yes. be supernatural. Maybe it is, but but we, we don't find it baffling when there's some sort of systematic way to solve the problem. Memory is a little bit harder because it's not so clear. There's not always a systematic way to get the answer. So the the procedure s- seems to be analogous. In in the paper, I give the example of I asked someone how to what, what the square root of seventeen hundred sixty four was, mm-hmm. and I said it's an integer. And the person said, "Well, I don't know. I, how, how, sh- how should I know?" And I said, "Well, give it a try." And and the person said, "Well, it's it's less than a hundred because a hundred times a hundred is you know it's got way too many zeros." And so all of a sudden we're down to We've narrowed it down from infinity, infinite number of <laughs> possibilities, down to 100 possibilities or, or 99 possibilities. And then, you know, he, he whittled away at the problem. 10 by 10 is 100, so it's bigger than 10. 20 by 20 is 400, so it's bigger than 20 and, and so on. And so, so whittling, whittling down from 50 times 50 to 40 times 40, 40 times 40 gets... It's, 40 times 40 is 1,600, 50 times 50 is 2,500, so we're somewhere between 40 and 50. And then you, can, you whittle it down further and eventually you come to 42, which is the correct answer. To everything. That's the answer of the Hitchhiker's Guide. But I that's wrote, right. <laughs> did you do that on purpose? No, I, I wrote the paper before I read the Hitchhiker's Guide. In fact, I might have written it before Douglas Adams wrote his book. Oh, maybe he got it from you. I'm not sure. If, uh, it would be about the same time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It was the well, early 80s. I have a quick question, too. While I was reading this, and I was also preparing for a class on verbal behavior in a different class, I was thinking, so would all of those responses that you emitted... I guess covertly or overtly, be considered interverbals. Is that a weird question? No, no, no. It's a, it's a good question. They would be considered interverbals in the sense that they're governed by verbal behavior. Right. I have a, a kind of a pet peeve about the term interverbal. I like to sure. restrict interverbal to those cases where a verbal response has been reinforced in the presence of the verbal antecedent. So okay. there's a history of reinforcement. For sure. Saying that. So, so like memorize poetry. Oh, oh, Jackie, you just gave us the third grade song. Right. <laughs> yeah. the, that was all interverbal because okay. you know, there was a history of reinforcement for those contiguous usages. Yes, it was amazing. <laughs> Tell my third grade teacher way to go. <laughs> but if I said, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? And you say cheese omelet, that's not an interverbal right. Right. because there's no history of reinforcement for having okay. said that. Mm-hmm. But uh, would all the in stuff, like, okay, yeah. Well, like 10 times 10 is, or what? Y- yes. No. Or the square the square of 10 is 1,000. That That stuff. would be, would that be? Th- that's right. Those those would okay. all be interverbals. Yeah, so 40 times 40 is 1,600. But me walking you... back, yeah, but me walking back through my day, be like, okay, yesterday was Wednesday and right. Wednesday. That was, those have never been reinforced. Yes. So that wouldn't be a considered an interval. But sort of the problem-solving right. process yes. yeah. had been... Covertly. Sure. But, but when, when you've done acting. it probably overtly yeah. in the past. I'm working through it with y'all. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the question isn't so much, is it an interval, is, is it mysterious? And I don't sure. think it's mysterious. Uh, the, 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 math, the math example is not mysterious. Unless the person had never engaged in anything like that before in which case we would wonder how they stumbled on it but the strategy of sort of whittling away at a at the possible the possible answers until you get closer closer and closer to the to the truth is a general problem solving strategy that works in a, in a wide variety of, of circumstances so so someone might hit on that strategy because of generalization from other problems that they've solved and the, and the same thing applies to memory. So how do we, I, I think I gave, I don't know if I gave an example in the paper or not, but I, I did a little exercise with trying to remember what happened on a particular day that was some years past. So what was I doing on September 19th, 2001, was the question. So the way I approached it was I said, well, what's, what year is it now? And, and so how many years ago was this? And, 
And I said, okay, so I, I, I taught at Smith College from 1989 to 19 to 2016, 2018. So I must have been at Smith. So I pulled up my syllabus and I said, okay. Uh, and I and I looked up the syllabus for 2001 and saw that I was teaching a pigeon lab. Mm-hmm. And I it met on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And I found out what day of the week the that that date was and it turned out to be a wednesday which was one of the lab days and and so then i look at my roster of students and so after all of the sort of dog work dog leg work leg work of <laughs> of reviewing syllabi looking at class lists finding the day of the week i was building up more and more prompts analogous to it's less than 100 it's bigger mm-hmm. than 10 had whittled it down to, I was at Smith College that day running a lab. Now, I didn't remember which lab it was, but then I went through the syllabus, and I recognized a couple of names on the syllabus, and I said, oh, yeah, that student was really proud of her pigeon. So, oh, I didn't ever say, I, I was never able to say definitively, well, this is what I was doing on September 19th. I was able to say with some probability that Sonia had been shaping her pigeon mm. on that day. And given that it was only the third Wednesday of the semester, it was probably the day she was doing chaining. So that would be my answer. And it would be a hell of a lot closer than saying, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's closer than that. <laughs> yeah. And going through similar kinds of stuff, we prompt things where we are fairly confident that we have the answer. And so we need to talk about where that confidence comes from and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, recognizing that we have a correct memory, if you will, mm-hmm. that, is, that, we've, that we've recreated behavior that, that was acquired in the past. How can we be confident that that behavior really was established in the past in, in, in the context in which we're, we're asking? I, I guess that's, that's, that then becomes the question. So the <laughs> You, know, you have all these mediating variables, makes sense. You engage in problem solving. And at some point, you just get tired of it. You just, <laughs> I'm just going to say something and hope for the best, you know, hope some social reinforcement occurs or people leave me alone and I don't have to answer this question. Or- yeah, well, well that's, a, that's a good question. With math problems, there's a distinctive algorithm, or there's an algorithm that leads to a distinctive solution. That is, when we're doing a multiplication problem, we do this and then we do that and we do the other thing and 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 then we read the we read the answer off the bottom of this flurry of calculations so we know that that is the answer at least that's the answer we've calculated whether it's right or not it's another matter but we there's a distinctive end to the math problem because of the nature of the algorithm with memory it's not so clear because people say they remember such and such, and it can be proven that they're wrong. Uh, I know that was a red car that ran into my bicycle. And in fact, it turns out it was a blue car. So, so people have false, their, their behavior is lawful. They say it was a red car. Saying it was a red car is, con, is, is under the control of the current constellation of variables. They're mm-hmm. sure that they're right, but in fact, they're not. So, so it's that what makes us think we're right? So it's not so much whether we are or are not right. What makes us stop engaging in memory, n- mnemonic behavior, and, and say, now I have it? Well, the actual event, when, once that behavior is emitted, it becomes a variable that controls other behavior. So right. if you really did have a cheese omelet, then it's going to start evoking memory of the waiter, you know, giving you this big fat bill for cheese omelet and, and how you dribble the cheese omelet on your, on your blouse and your husband was going to memor- memorialize it in a poem. And, and <laughs> so all, all, of, all of these associated things come to strength. Once you have the anchor, mm-hmm. it's to turn into a reminiscence. That is, uh, it, mm-hmm. it, it sort of builds, you, you build up Associated from that to things that that were immediately around you, and 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 you can you can you can picture it in a conditioned perception, 
you can start recalling incidental features of the experience. That sort of reification, the rebuilding of the experience in the present has a lot of corroboration from all of the supporting behavior that comes to strength. So, and, and that's fairly commonplace when the event is recent. So, so we can, we, you, for example, all three of you could probably remember yesterday's events with some clarity. But if I asked you about a month ago yesterday, it would be, it would be a, more of a struggle. Mm. It would be a real struggle. Well, unless, unless it were, <laughs> what did we do a month ago, Wednesday? And then it probably oh, yeah. had something to this. do with recording a podcast. And then we right. can, you know, look at our list of, you know, <laughs> yeah. we can do some well, of those. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and once you said, oh, that was the, the podcast with that Palmer guy. He, he, he's so conceited. He, he thinks he's better than Skinner and so on. Uh, so, so you would have all these associated, I don't think I'm better than Skinner, believe me. <laughs> uh, but uh, all these, yeah, as you say, if it were Wednesday, you, you, would, you would be able to, Talk a lot about what happened, and, and once you started, yeah. once you once you fastened on which uh, person you were interviewing, then there would be a whole cascade of associated conditioned responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Dave, I, I know we're 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 getting close to the end of our our time. So, I I definitely this is a selfish question, but I sort of wanted to ask your potential interpretation of. You know, what, what I consider one of my favorite, you know, memory tricks, and it's that I'm, I'm very good, not the best in the world or anything, but I'm very good at recalling actor names just from hearing their voices. So, you know, they're in like an animated movie and I go, oh, that's and then I'm able to name who they are and all the things. So is is this an example of just that, that, that stimulus control sort of form of remembering like oh, I, it's associated with some sort of reinforcement because I'm pretty sure no one that I know and Diana you can corroborate this has ever reinforced whether <laughs> with money or social praise the fact that I've been able to do this I can't do it uh, at all well there's always a possibility that you're a genetic mutant that is some new kind of creature on earth for which my theories don't apply. Right. So, so you can recall the name from hearing the voice. Well, at, at the time, at the time you hear the voice, let, let, let's look at some, some extreme examples. Suppose you watched a movie and you, of course, heard the, heard the voice of the main actor, but you had to leave before the credits rolled and you didn't recognize the actor. So you wouldn't know the name of the actor, so it would be impossible for you to recall the name simply from hearing the voice. But let's suppose that the next day you said, who was that actor anyway? So you went on the web and you looked up the movie and it said the actor who played the role of the, I don't know, the vicar or something was <laughs> uh, Hugh Grant. <laughs> oh, okay, you'd recognize him. But anyway, it was uh, Elmer Fudd. You see the name separate from hearing the voice. Would you be able to, at a later time, I mean, a month later, six months later, would you be able to give the name when you hear the voice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would. Okay. So I would not. Mm -hmm. Ever. Yeah. But you would, Rob. I would. Our kids okay. can do this, too, to some degree, so there might actually be a genetic thing. <laughs> I think I've modeled, I think I've modeled the, the behavior. I've given them lots to... A lot of problem solving they can go with through, but the point is that this would be a case where it's not contiguous. That is, you uh, right. if you heard the if you heard the voice at the same time, you're thinking, "Boy, that Hugh Laurie, he's a great actor." You say, "Oh, and he's got this English accent sometimes, and an American accent other times, and it's hard to believe, but it's the same guy." Uh, yeah, then there's an example when you hear Hugh Laurie speak in an American accent. Do you say Hugh Laurie? And when you hear him hear say it in a British accent, do you say Hugh Laurie? I think so because I think I've I've heard him I've heard him do both voices so yeah that yeah, one yeah. I think I could but the, but the case I gave a minute ago where you he read the name separate from hearing the voice there has to be some kind of mediation there so you would have to I would guess remember that as you would engage in some kind of conditioned perception under not under the control of his name but under control of the movie yeah. title you would have a conditioned perception of the person's name. And now it's paired with the name, sorry, the person's voice. And now the voice is paired with the name. 
Uh, now I'm making all this up, uh, and and, mm-hmm. and and you can make it up as well as I can. That is, I don't have any inside track uh, of truth <laughs> here, uh, but I think it's not implausible. I think it's not implausible that you you hear, you engage in conditioned hearing. Yeah. That is, I I can, like right now, I can I can imagine Beethoven's Fifth or the timpanis and everything, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at least the first few notes. And I think that given your particular interest in actors and their voices, that you, you would perhaps hear yourself recreating the voice at the time you read the, the name. And in other mm-hmm. words, I have, I have no idea how you could do that. Mm-hmm. It, that is, you have, to, you have to bring the two into contiguity in order for them to be, to be linked like that. And, mm-hmm. and it seems to me that you are the one that's, you're, you're bringing the voice to the reading of the of the name but in the usual case where you know the actor's name and you hear the voice then they're contiguous so so y- you you might be saying uh, oh i love this guy and you're hearing him talk and but you also might have uh, what, what what's special about you might be your interest in accents or just the topography of people's voices whereas most people might not just 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 might not have that that kind of interest in the distinctive way, the idiosyncratic mm-hmm. way people people speak. Sure, you can I, become more discriminating mm-hmm. in, in anything if you yes. study it, right? So you 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 have that with voices in a way that mm-hmm. most people don't. Definitely not me. No, no. You're, no. I'm always it, I. You're always so embarrassed by me that I don't yep. know who that actor is. Come on, is. you gotta know. I would be, you would hate me so much. <laughs> like, how do you not know? I don't know. It's that one guy that's in the Hallmark movies. That's how I can do it. <laughs> well, Rob, you, you, you don't have a reputation for this, so it might make you behave. You might that attend, if you will, mm-hmm. more closely mm-hmm. now that you know that your reputation's on the line. And if your colleagues find out you can't do it, you'll never hear the end of it. So, true. so you that's might, true. Uh, this is your, this is your thing. That's good. That's the thing I'll, I'm going to be known for. That's, that's so great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dave, I appreciate you taking the time to put a lot of thought behind a really self-indulgent <laughs> question <laughs> after you've already been talking to us for so long. So I thank you. <laughs> I, yeah. I am really touched and honored. <laughs> uh, I, I love behavioral puzzles. I, <laughs> I, I don't know that my explanation was, was persuasive, but, but, but it seems to me to be to, to have the least superficial plausibility to it. So, Dave, uh, you know, as as we wrap up, I think you know we do a section at the end of the show, the dissemination station. Okay, thank you. Shaggy did not remember that that is her cue. I didn't know that was my cue. I thought that was you were your cue. Oh, talking. Oh no, so that's why I stopped and pointed at you. I was trying to give you as many yeah, you know, cues as possible. Certainly, I think read the paper. You know, use use what's in there to continue with, you know, thinking about behavioral mm-hmm. puzzles. But it's not like sometimes when it's, oh, you know, we talked about preference assessments. Here's how you would use a preference assessment. You know, would you say that people who, you know, listen to this, they read the paper, they're, they're, they want to discuss this behavioral interpretation. Do you think they will make more friends if they go to their developmental mm-hmm. minded or their neuroscience minded colleagues and share this information with them? Because it, it does seem that Everyone just wants to hear about things as brain, brain this, like the, like mm. they love that. Like, like we, you said at the beginning of the show, everyone loves the mind file. They love mm-hmm. the storage solution. So is this something that we're just going to keep to ourselves as, as behavior analysts, something that, you know, we, we should be sharing, you know, this, this separate, this different interpretation with less like-minded individuals. What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm being self-centered here, but I think, I think this is right. I, th- I think, I think the paper that I wrote is correct. <laughs> Good, right? That's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it will te- stand the test of time. And I must say that most of the cognitive metaphors have have been in the rubbish bin for, you know, they, they last for a few years and then, then they're rejected. But in, in talking with people from different disciplines, it's really important not to be dogmatic or confrontational or arrogant or get into battles. The persuasion is a shaping paradigm. If you want to get someone from point A to point Z, they have to go through the whole alphabet to get from A to Z. And you can't try to get them there in one step. So be, becoming confrontational and saying, uh, you, 
you, you guys are full of baloney. This, this mm. behavioral interpretation is the way to go is not going to persuade anybody of anything. So mm. I, I would suggest, I mean, if, if anyone's open to, you know, the behavioral point of view, then by all means, uh, describe it in as much detail as possible, but, but present it as a hypothesis and not something that you're sure is right the way I am. And, and, I, and I have no reason to think that the listeners are going to, you know, go leaping with joy at this, the, the very idea of this, this point of view. But, but if, if a reader finds it persuasive, I would say, remember that you're shaping behavior. So what, is, what does your interlocutor think? So you have to start from where they are and inch them toward where you want them to be. So don't be dogmatic, don't be confrontational, but do be a good listener and, and try to find that, that possible next point of agreement by whatever that might be. It would be idiosyncratic. But the neurophysiologists would have no problem with this point of view. The, it's the cognitive psychologists who, are, who feel as though they have a dog in the fight where they, they have to you know, defend the, the cognitive metaphors. But the neurophysiologists know that there's no, no box in the head, mm-hmm. uh, that there are glial cells and, and cerebral spinal fluid and blood vessels, and then there's a scadillion neurons, and that's about it. So they want a, a theory that's compatible with, with that point of view. And the stimulus control, memory is a stimulus control phenomenon, is perfectly compatible with that. The memory is problem solving is much too complex. To, to give any guidance to a neurophysiologist. Dave, thank you again so much for coming on the show, for talking all about this, you know, very, very complicated interpretation. Although like Diana but said, not. but also <laughs> not, I, I, I think definitely like re- reading the paper, it was like, yes, this makes sense. This makes sense. When I then was trying to explain to someone, oh, I just read this great paper. It was a little harder for me to then put it in my own words. So I had to go back and read it again. But when I, when I was reading it, it, it all made so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone is listening and they're like, oh, I don't, that sounds too comp. You know what? It's, it's, it's all there in the paper. And I think very well, very well laid out. Well, thank you. And anyone who wants to read it, do you have a link for it? Or I, I, they can write to me. At, we'll uh, link it. Yeah, we'll okay. link it. And, and, and yeah. Give them, yeah. Uh, give them Dave, if you'd like email. to share your, your email for folks, oh, if sure. they have their, their own, if they want to ask you about their own bizarre memory yeah, tricks. Yeah, you know? Around the, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's DC Palmer at smith.edu. Uh, Jackie has the email address. So. Yeah. Once again, we want to say a big, big thank you to Dr. David Palmer for coming on the show, talking all about memory, a concept that when we first started preparing for the show, I said, this is going to be impossible, but then reading the paper and then getting the real enjoyment of hearing Dr. Palmer talk about writing it and the concepts behind it, I think makes a lot of sense. We hope you agree too. Again, if you're not still not quite sure, definitely read that paper. It all makes sense. We, we promise. All three of us promise. And Dr. Palmer promise. <laughs> I don't know if he promises too, but I'm, I'm guessing he'd, I'm guessing he would think strongly of that. Want to make sure you get that last secret code word. It is rock R O C K. Whether it's the mineral made up of, I don't know, minerals, what, what are rocks made of or the, again, you know, type of type of bird uh, rock. Either way, we won't know which one you're thinking of when you type it in, but please do type it in rock. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you very much for listening. If you like our show, we'd really love it if you left us a review on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you uh, you know listen to your podcast. Maybe even subscribe to the show. That would be so helpful. There are a lot of other ways that you can reach out to us. We're on all of the social medias as ABA Inside Track. You can find these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles that we discuss, as well as our back catalog and places to purchase CEs for any of our episodes. You can also, if you would like even more ABA Inside Track, go to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for just $5 a month, you're able to subscribe, get episodes a week ahead of time, plus get access to multiple special events we're doing this year. We're doing live episodes that only patrons can join. You are, we're doing some Q&As with some of our behavior anal- analysis friends on a variety of topics that uh, listeners have either asked for or seem to enjoy. And if you're interested in even, even more than that, well, at the premium $10 level, you can join us for our quarterly book club podcast, where for two hours or more, we discuss a behavior analytic or behavior analytic adjacent book. We recently 
just put out our discussion of Nudge, the final edition, the behavioral economics classic, I guess it would be called. So if you want to hear about that, plus get two CEs as well as some discounts on other CEs just for joining in, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. And if you want to send us an email with feedback or questions, please feel free to do so at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. I want to make sure to again thank Dr. David Palmer for spending the evening with us, for Jackie and Diana for co-hosting the show and always having so many great questions. Thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for his interstitial music, Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his editing work, and Hollis Urban from Sycamore Workshop for his visual designs. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye!